Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of the session now is War and Peace. Join us for an insightful exploration of the theme War and Peace as we delve into the complex dynamics that shape international relations and conflict resolution. In this panel discussion, we will examine the intricacies of war, its causes, consequences, and the challenges it poses to global stability. At the same time, we will explore the pursuit of peace, diplomatic efforts, and strategies aimed at preventing conflicts and fostering cooperation among nations. Guiding this stimulating discussion is our distinguished moderator, Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma, retired, a decorated military veteran. His, expensive, his extensive experience in national security and defense will ensure a comprehensive exploration of the theme. Don't miss this opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the intricate interplay between war and peace in our ever-changing world. I now request the panelists to come up on the stage, please. Mr. Tilak Dev Deveshar, Ambassador TCA Raghavan. I also request our moderator, Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma, PVSM, UYSM, AVSM, VSM, retired to come up on the stage. So, sir, there is more chairs than the audience, sir. So, we'll be speaking more to the chairs than to the audience. That's what I said. Okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, thanks USI for inviting us over for this discussion on war and peace. Can you hear me, please? Thank you, sir. And uh, <clears throat> the subject is our gain currency now when people say that when there were sanctions applied against Russia, uh, where their $600 billion were sealed away, was it war or was it peace? And when does war start is an issue which is in minds of most people and your definition of war itself is now controversial. Uh, so the, uh, I have an esteemed panel here, <coughs> Mr. Tilak Dawasar, whose books are authority by itself and so is Ambassador Raghavan's book. Uh, we look forward to having an intimate discussion. Uh, we uh, would do, I think so we will give up five minutes each, then we can discuss issues. Five minutes we can talk initially, make initial points and then we can talk about it. So the uh, issue that I want to start with is uh, what we are going to do is that I'm going to talk China largely and um, Mr. Tilak Devasar will talk about uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan and uh, Ambassador Raghavan largely about Pakistan and India. So we know we'll cover these areas um, which are more relevant to all of us. So is absence of war mean peace? That's the basic issue that one wishes to ask oneself. That are we at peace today? We are, are we at war or are we at peace? Or we are neither, neither what the Western people say, are we in some kind of a gray zone? So that's a very important issue because it lays down the very uh, basics of how we go across in, and contemplate the issues of war and peace. Now, they, uh, when you ask the United Nations or political scientists, they say when you have 1,000 casualties in a war of combatants, that becomes war. And if it is less than that, it is no, no more war. That's maybe a prim, primitive way of defining what war is about. And peace is stated to be absence of war. Both these definitions are controversial and are um, contentious. Now, I would uh, initially make two, three, four points, points here, especially regarding China. What did the Chinese do uh, on economic coercion and economic measures all over the world making life difficult for nations, was it war or was it peace? Now, people might say that economic coercion is no more war. The fact of the matter is that they cause immense amount of grievance. Uh, in Australia, which had an FTA with, with China earlier in 2015, uh, and used to sell 40% of their wines across to United States, uh, to China, was stopped one fine morning in November 2020. No more wines from China, I'm sorry, from Australia that literally collapsed the wine industry in Australia. Norway gave a, um, a, a medal, uh, uh, a peace prize to Mr. Liu, and they said, okay, we don't buy any salmon from Norway. Uh, South Korea said we will, uh, in, they were installing a THAAD, which is the ballistic missile defense in South Korea, and one, all 140 malls, which were located, uh, South Korean malls in China, called Lotte Malls, were uh, sealed in one wine morning because they said their firefighting equipment is poor. The Philippines had problems. They said, okay, we won't buy bananas from Philippines. 
the Chine Chinese are masters economic coercion and uh, they plan it in a very systematic manner. They, they, what they have done to H&M and Nike saying when H&M said, okay, we will not buy cotton coming from Xinjiang because of HR reasons, they said, okay, all H&M stores and Nike stores are closed hereby in China. This is war. What about India? Are we under influence of China? If there is a think tank in Delhi which gets funding from China, well, the think tank will write obviously languages which are favorable to Chinese. So is that war or peace? That is influencing our minds. Or for that matter, we say when movies are made, Chinese have an understanding with the Indian film industry. No movie has been made in Hollywood from 1997 which is anti-Chinese. No movie. Last movie made was about Dalai Lama and a movie about uh, uh, Tibet, which Brad Pitt had acted. The Chinese banned Columbia North TriStar for all movie sale. China has got 41,000 screens. If Chinese say we don't want to buy your movies, that movie fails in the world. India, we rush to make an anti-Pakistan movie. Anything happens, we rush to make one. We never make anti-Chinese movies. Can somebody give a thought to it? Why we don't make anti-Chinese movies? Because finally, if, um, if Dangal earned 1,200 crores uh, from China, 1,200 crores is a lot of money for the, for the movie. And that's why one of the movies uh, which you know, Rockstar, uh, you know, Rockstar, you would have seen that, Sada Hak Rak. That song was filmed in, uh, in uh, Dharamshala and there was a banner shown, Free Tibet. The banner was shown, Free Tibet. And the movie was released and there was a, there was a flag of, uh, uh, of Tib uh, Free Tibet flag also being shown in that song which was being sung. And lo and behold, the, all the uh, rushes were withdrawn back and that free Tibet, the Tibet word was removed from there because of the Chinese coercion. And the flag was removed and the face of, I think Ranbir was acting in that movie, it came in. Sorry, sir? Ranbir tha mera kya? Chalo kya what's, what's, uh, what is an actor among friends? <laughs> and look, uh, we see a movie called Pathan. You would have seen Pathan? For once, we have a beautiful, goody-goody ISI agent here. Who in India wants to talk about a goody-goody ISI agent and, and a rogue um, RNAW agent? And the movie was sold 100, uh, 100 crores in China even before it's released in India. That's kind of coercion that we are on. And in media, when we say this news click, which you know now, and uh, Daily Hunt. Daily Hunt it was a totally Chinese agency which was supplying news across to most of us who don't get time to read news the news supplied 25 million people in India are subscribed to Delhi hunt or getting news from Delhi hunt and Delhi hunt belonged to Chinese so that is that war or peace also what happened in eastern Ladakh without firing a shot firstly what they did in East China South China Sea okay they took over the South China Sea without firing a shot they denied us great patrolling rights into eastern Ladakh without firing a shot. What, what happened in Galwan was an accident. But what has the, what has the aftermath of what happened in, uh, in um, eastern Ladakh is that large amount of Indian army has got no peace station left. So we have all moved upwards. We are not deployed. So the fact of the matter is that without firing a shot, um, a great amount of stress has been brought about. And also now that when we come to this issue of the infrastructure being built and the forces being uh, deployed out there, this is actually great amount of military coercion that we must be facing or we are facing. So is this war or this is peace? It is a way the Chinese fight war in 2,500 years ago, Sun Tzu said the same thing. And similarly was stated later on by uh, Zhuge Liang that you know we want to fight without, we want to win without fighting. And of course, these two colonels who wrote the book on restricted warfare 20 years ago said the same thing, winning without fighting. I'll end by saying, uh, of the last eight, nine months, President Xi has visited a whole lot of PLA establishments. And he says, uh, and everywhere he goes and says, and the Americans are quoting him, dare and win, dare and win, win without fight, win, win wars, victory. This is the words he's using. 
is victory got a definition in the 21st century? Does victory imply something like Bangladesh, capture of territory, or capture of prisoners of war, or changing a regime, or destruction of war fighting wherewithal? All these are past theories of victory. Victory has to be redefined in war in the 21st century. Those, those norms of victory are no more relevant here. So in questions of war and peace, against China, we are at war. You may not want to say so for various reasons. But the kind of influence and disinformation being carried out against India by the Chinese and, of course, with their closest friends, Pakistanis, it's, it's kind of war and we need to be prepared for it. With that, I think I'll rest the Chinese for some time and invite Mr. Tilak Devasa to give an initial talk on Pakistan, sir. Yeah, okay. Okay, fine. May I request you, sir? Ambassador Raghavan, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, let me also say I'm very grateful to the USI for having invited me and made me part of this uh, very distinguished uh, panel. Uh, well, let me begin by just commenting a little bit about uh, what General Sharma said, because he's always very, very provocative, and I therefore always enjoy greatly uh, listening to what he has to say. So are we at peace or are we at war uh, with China? Well, we have very bad relations at the present uh, stage. We've had a skirmish on the line of actual control not too uh, long ago. So clearly, we are going through a very bad phase. But is a bad phase in neighborhood relations something which we should then proximate to war? I mean, this is the question. As a military man, I would say yes, you have to be prepared for the worst. The balloon can go up any time. It is part of his job to be ready for that contingency. But in general, as citizens, because we are going through a bad phase in our neighborhood, does that mean we are in a situation just short of war? I would say no. Because neighborhoods are, by definition, bad places. You look around the world, you'll find neighborhood relations all across in different states of crisis. You can look at what is happening in Ukraine, a war in Europe in different ways. Is it NATO expansion? Is it Russian autocracy? I see it as Russia and Ukraine not being able to manage their relations as neighbors. You look at what is happening in Israel or in Gaza, bad neighborhood relations. We are in a difficult neighborhood. We have to manage our relations with our neighbors. It does not mean that we are next to a state of war. It does not also mean that we don't have to be prepared. We have to be prepared. But we don't have to talk about war, you know, and keep it as a constant imagery in our minds all the time. Because it takes you down the track of what I call self-fulfilling prophecies. We don't want to pick committed strokes. We have to be ready. We have to assess the situation uh, carefully, clinically. But let's not play committed strokes. And I do think we also be, should be careful about demonizing the others. Bad relations with neighbors is not surprising. It happens all over the world, as I said. And certainly we can say that, you know, the Chinese have so much influence. They are our largest trading partner. Look at the kind of influence that they have. But we should also see it in context. When you have a huge economy and you have neighboring countries, that major economy will have decisive or major economic influences. We have economic influences all over the world. We use that influence too. It doesn't mean that we are, that that country is, is in a state of war or that it is adopting war-like postures. Look at the influence that the United States has in India or look at the influence some European countries have in India. Our elite, half the elite, three-fourths of the elite, their children live in those countries. What about that influence? Does it mean that it's a state of war? No, it's not. We have to be careful about external influences without exaggerating or demonizing the party which has that influence. This is the real world. Because we live in a globalized world, there will be influences. There is no way you can cut yourself off from, uh, you know, your, from other countries, from other powers. You can't live in an insulated, uh, uh, in a world by, uh, you know, a make-believe world. We have to deal with the world as it is. So now on Pakistan, I think I've already said uh, partly what I meant to. I think with Pakistan, as with China, we are going through a very bad phase since 2016. 
you, you have presently a situation, there are no high commissioners in place, trade is banned, there's virtually no people-to-people -people, uh, contact, and while the Pakistan cricket team uh, is in India, you don't associate, what is happening during the course of that, those cricket matches is absent, is, 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 is not accompanied by the normal things which would take place when a neighboring country's cricket team comes. There are no Pakistanis coming here to watch the matches. There's generally a sense of uh, tension, or perhaps a little bit of bad blood when each match is played. It's not a good state in uh, your overall bilateral relationship for the past uh, seven, eight uh, years. But is this a new norm? Does it mean that you are, you are uh, in a sense, uh, 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 it is necessary or it is inevitable that this will be the state of your relationship with Pakistan uh, all the time? In my view, no, because it depends largely on what are the choices which India, as the larger country, makes in dealing with its neighbors, and especially with a neighbor like Pakistan. Uh, all the difficulties, all the provocations, all of Pakistan's revision, revisionisms, that is true, and it is a given. And we have to be ready uh, and uh, always on our guard in dealing with a difficult neighbor like Pakistan. But does it mean that you are, you are in a sense, uh, committed or uh, inevitably predisposed to having a situation uh, of the kind you have with Pakistan since 2016, all times to come? I don't think so. I think uh, India-Pakistan relations historically, if one looks at the last five, six decades, it goes through an up and down pattern. And we are in the, in, in the process of a prolonged downswing. But the downswing will end and uh, upswing will uh, begin. And that is to do a great deal with how neighborhood relations, uh, both in South Asia but all across the world, uh, have always behaved. If you look at India-Nepal relations, India-Sri Lanka relations, India-Bangladesh relations, India-China relations, there's always been this up and down uh, pattern. And it's important that we understand that because neighborhood, as I said at the beginning, are at the heart of any country's foreign policy. And we shouldn't expect a predictable, stable, boring uh, kind of relationship which will remain unchanged. It won't work like that because it doesn't work like that anywhere in the world. Thank you. I join Ambassador Akbar in thanking the USI for having me here and to General Rakesh Sharma for his very, ins I thought, very insightful and provocative comments. One thing that struck me the most was that you mentioned that uh, more than 1,000 casualties means a war. You know, by that standard, according to a Pakistani think tank, in the first nine months of this year, there were 1,100 casualties due to terrorism of which 386 were security forces, army, paramilitary, and police. So Pakistan is definitely in a state of war uh, as per that definition. But the moot point that I want to mention is why has this happened? You'll all recall that in uh, August 2021, there was much euphoria and jubilation in Pakistan when the Taliban captured Kabul. Pakistan felt that you know their 20-year covert policy of supporting the Taliban to get back into Kabul and capture, um, establish control over Afghanistan had succeeded. So there was a lot of happiness. Imran Khan said the Afghans have broken the shackles of slavery, or whatever he meant to say by that. <clears throat> and the reason for this was that the conventional wisdom in Pakistan was that a Taliban government in Kabul <coughs> sorry, would take care of Pakistan's security interests in three respects. One, India will be thrown out of Afghanistan. Second, the Taliban would recognize the Durand Line as the international border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And third, the Taliban will take care of the TTP, restrain them, if not actually defang them. Two years down the road, Pakistan's policy is in tatters, and their security has been badly compromised. There is no jubilation. The mood is very grim. India is back in Kabul at the invitation of the Taliban, who want us to now continue doing the infrastructure projects that we were doing earlier. The acting defense minister, Mullah Yaqub, son of Mullah Omar, has said that he will send Indian uh, Afghan military officers for training uh, to India. The Taliban have refused to recognize the Durand line. They're unlikely to do so. Even in Taliban 1.0, there were three times when Pakistan insisted 
that they recognized the Jurand line and the Taliban had refused even then. The Taliban, like every Afghan government since 1949, does not accept the Durand line as the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. They say it's an unresolved issue and the decision is for the Afghan people on both sides of the Durand line. And third, the Taliban have refused to take action against the Tehreek Taliban Pakistan, <coughs> the TTP. The reason is that the links between the Taliban and the TTP are very deep. They're both ideological and also based on Pashtun Veli, the way of the Pashtun. Ideologically, the leader of the TTP has sworn allegiance, what's called Beth, to the supreme leader of the Taliban, Ahmadullah Khunzada. As per Pashtun Wali, the tribal air people had given shelter to the Taliban in 2001 when the US threw them out of power. The same tribal people today are organized at the GTP. So the Taliban have to give them shelter and sanctuary. If they don't, they will be called Pagarath or dishonorable, which is the worst slur you can give to a Pashtun. So there is no way the Taliban will take action against the TTP. What they've done is they've facilitated talks with Pakistan. Talks are broken down, as you know, ceasefire has been uh, violated, and the Taliban are on a rampage. So to that extent, there is certainly uh, a war which Pakistan faces, both internally, as far as the, the TTP is concerned, and externally with the Afghan Taliban. Because there have been clashes on the Durand line, uh, parts of the fence has been uprooted by the Taliban because they don't uh, accept it. The options for Pakistan are very limited. They cannot take action against the TTP like they could do earlier in the Zar uh, army operation Zarbe Azb, because that time they had the US uh, drones who took out most of the leadership of the TTP. And, but today, the TTP has got shelter and sanctuary in Afghanistan. They didn't have it earlier. Second, if they carry out any attacks or try to attack TTP camps in Afghanistan, there will be a massive retaliation from Afghanistan, especially in terms of terrorism and suicide bombing. They would not want to risk that. Besides, any attack on Afghanistan would immediately impact the Pashtun population of Pakistan itself. So I don't think so. Uh, Pakistan army can risk doing that. So they are trying to impress, pressurizing the Taliban. Now you must have heard about 1.7 million refugees being pushed out of uh, Pakistan. This is again a pressure tactic to the Taliban. Because the Taliban will not be able to, have, there's already a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. They will not be able to cater to 1.7 million. Not that Pakistan will be able to throw them out. But even if they do, this is a pressure point on the Taliban. So Pakistan is trying to pressurize the Taliban to restrain the TTP not carry out action against them. But I think the uh, options for the Pakistan army are extremely limited, both vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban. You see, in the last 20 years, the Taliban have gained a lot of diplomatic experience and acumen. Today, Pakistan is not their most important or only ally. They have links with China, they have links with Russia, with Qatar, with the Central Asian states. And they are leveraging these links that they have and not only being dependent on Pakistan. And because of the TTP, they have strategic depth in Pakistan. TTP, in fact, is the dagger that the Taliban has at Pakistan's throat. That if Pakistan were ever to act <clears throat> in a particular manner, they could always activate the TTP. The TTP, in turn, has strengthened itself because a lot of the uh, splinter groups that have broken away from the TTP have rejoined it. Under the new leadership, of, uh, the, not new, he became leader in 2018, Noorwali Masood. He has unified the TTP. He has created an organizational structure model on the Taliban. So today, the TTP has got shadow governors and shadow provinces in seven districts of KPK, one in Gilgit, Pakistan, one in the Pashtun areas of Balochistan, one in the Baloch areas, Qatar, I mean, this Kalat and Makran, and two provinces even in Punjab, North Punjab and South Punjab. They've got ministries. They've got a very sophisticated media an info war campaign. They even have a podcast. They have a, a newsletter for women, Khawateen Ka Jihad, you know, supporting, asking the women to support Jihad. So it's a very widespread network that the TTP has been able to establish. It is going to be extremely difficult for Pakistan to tackle the TTP over the long term. As it is in a state of war, as I mentioned, 1,100 casualties only in the first nine months, including 386 service personnel. So I think. 
Pakistan is at war, certainly not peace, both vis-a-vis -vis the TTP and with Afghanistan, I think it's a gray area. So I'll leave it at that and I think we look forward to questions and conversation amongst ourselves. So one of the story is that uh, even three of us and two erudite gentlemen, we can't agree in what's war and peace. So I think we'll, support, we'll uh, seek assistance from the audience in some time. Uh, the point I also want to raise is that Chinese call something military operation other than war. You know, they had a law of this kind in 2007-8. And uh, to quote the law, it simply said that they wish to, and it's been reiterated in 2021 under a different heading. And it's called, they want to create a favorable external environment and alter status quo without actually getting into a war. Changing of altering status quo in matters of territory without firing a shot, is that war or that's peace? Or that, that we should accept it without actually getting involved into firefight? Very, very difficult issues to answer. But that's what the Chinese have been saying and they've been doing it all this while. Now, my question, uh, my, let me take the moderator's prerogative. And you know, it's a, it's a fun time really to ask questions from such erudite people sitting next to me. <laughs> Sorry, lighter way. The questions are, um, uh, Mr. Raghavan, my question is that if the Chinese are working assiduously to all our neighboring countries in many uh, fields to put pressure on us, and I'll quote this by saying, we all know about Sri Lanka, the, the harbors they're making, the five roads being made into Nepal, which starts from Tibet and going to end down at the Rai region. Uh, the BNS Sheikh Hasina that they made at in Bangladesh, which is to ha put harbor for submarines and frigates, which, uh, I mean, submarines, the Bangladesh don't ha doesn't have it. And of course, Pakistan, they are cahoots together. You know, Kakkar Saab went recently, and there were some very goody-goody signs. You are the end all for us, he said. The kind of pressure and the pressure being brought to us on the borders, while we'll say this is not war, but isn't it bringing us pressure across to us in a manner that it will be, you know, just following the definition of war does not mean hakikat movie, let's say uh, that type. It's the kind of pressure brought to us. We are under tremendous amount of strain in each one of these uh, areas happening us. If that's not war, but this is a tough piece, sir. What do you say, sir? Well, we live in a tough neighborhood. So, you know, uh, I, I don't think we can, uh, there's an easy cop out to say that what a country is doing is something totally ultra virus or totally malefied. This is, this is the neighborhood which we live in and we should understand what is happening because General Sharma is right. What, is, what we are witnessing is something very significant. You see, we have all, certainly people like us, we were brought up in an age where your general worldview was that let's keep great powers out of our subcontinent. Let's keep them out of our region. It's good for us and it's good for our region. Because great powers bring in all kinds of other issues and we get diverted away from, our, uh, from the tasks which really are relevant for us, which is economic development, social development, education and so on. So let's keep great powers out. But that age has passed. It's no longer a situation where we can keep great powers out because you have a great power in the form of China, which is very much part of your region. You have to deal with it. We can't just complain about it. This is not some outsider coming in. This is very much of an insider. And all your neighbors see it as an insider. So you know the old, the old models we had, and these are deeply, deeply uh, ingre impressed in our mind that what works, what has worked for India will also work for our neighbors. So for Sri Lanka, for instance, when they faced this major problem, uh, ethnic conflict, Tamils, etc., we told them that, look, look at the Indian constitution and see the kind of federal model it has. If you apply that, it will be easier for you. With Nepal, similarly, from time to time, we've said, look at the Indian constitution, 
this is the template which will work uh, for you. You know, those days are past because these countries will say, we are not interested in your model. We have a different model to look at. And the fact is, you know, whether we like it or not, the Chinese have provided a new kind of model for economic modernity for each of our neighbors. So it's not coercion. It's something. It's threatening us. <laughs> so it's not coercion. You know, it's not simple coercion. There is a certain attraction for the Chinese uh, model. The challenge for us is we have to deal with this. There's no point complaining about it because nobody will take it seriously. Great powers, when they have enormous resources, will use all the resources to further their national interests. How we deal with it is really up to us. And which is why I say using a war imagery is an easy cop out. They are, we have to do many more things which are much more difficult than think of security options. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions? Neither here, neither there situation, sir. And sir, so you very, very nicely put it out. We may be heading in for some kind of a wish-fulfilling prophecy. You know, by the kind of line of narrative that is being pre prepared in the media and things like this. But this narrative is being spread across the world of tension with India and China. And propagated largely by the USA as well. Now, do you feel that this no war, no peace situation which is going on right now could escalate into a war thanks to the USA who want to have India, Ukraine make us fight a war on their behalf in with China, leading the narrative into a direct war? And could this situation lead to that, sir? You have, uh, Ajay, a great imagination, yeah? Back to you, please. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank I you. learned a lot from you. <laughs> <laughs> the fact of the matter is that nobody can, I mean, my view, nobody can push us to war. No United States and no China. If we have to be pushed into war, we have to be pushed in the war ourselves. No United States, you know, even if there is a Taiwan contingency, that doesn't propel us to come into war. So, I mean, that kind of war, you know, interstate war. When I say war, interstate war. We can't be pushed into interstate war of this kind, uh, even if the United States wants to push us. I mean, we are not Ukraine. Yeah? We are a country uh, which has got capacities beyond uh, most nations of the world. We are a likable country. I'm mean, due respects to Ambassador Raghwan, who's worked lifelong. For whatever reasons is, we are a light country in the world. Whatever, I mean, whatever we do, we are, we are, we are liked, you know, why? We are not buying influenced by virtue of um, um, deep pockets uh, the Chinese are doing. We are not going to Global South and Global South responding to us because we got deep pockets and we got a BRI or whatever they call it going. It's because of our historic good relations with large number of countries across the world and because of our diaspora, which is all working so eminently in various countries and of course because of our strong diplomacy here. So we are not being pushed into any kind of conflict till the time we want to get pushed into it. So that's my view of saying it, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir, please, all yours. So I, I agree with you. You know, you take the case of uh, Afghanistan. India is the only country that didn't have an agenda in Afghanistan. Every other country, whether it was Pakistan, Russia, China, something or other, they wanted. India is the only country that went in with $3 billion investment over 20 years to make projects for the Afghan people whether it was hospital, whether it was a parliament building, whether it was road. We would never say, Ki, we want this, we want so much to in government, you give us this. That was never there. Therefore, even today, the country or the people who are liked most is India and Indians. And even when Pakistanis go to Afghanistan, the hotel keeper and everybody will tell them, if somebody asks you, say you're an Indian, never say you're a Pakistani. Because if you say you're a Pakistani, and they will say Punjabi, and they'll <laughs> really get after you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So my question is regarding Afghanistan. So as we all know that in late 80s, when the Soviets left Af Afghanistan, the Mujahids were sitting unemployed. So they needed a new target, and they chose Kashmir. And then how millions of firearms found their way into the Kashmir. And we also how in the 90s, the terrorism was, in, was at its peak in the Kashmir. And sir, now there's a so-called peace in Afghanistan when the, after the American withdrawal. Sir, so how will this affect situation in Kashmir for us? It's an interesting uh, uh, point. But you see, between 
Afghanistan and Kashmir, you have Pakistan. So you're very right. So many of the Taliban fighters who were trained in Pakistani madrasas for jihad and for shahadat are actually frustrated because of peace in Afghanistan. Because instead of fighting, they've been asked to join the police or man check posts. So many of them have now joined the TTP. They would rather be fighting than to be living in peace. So I think before they land up in Kashmir, they'll have to pass through uh, Pakistan and the TTP. And there a very interesting thing has happened with the TTP itself. The TTP, Noor Wali Masood, as I mentioned, he has asked Pakistani ulemas that you taught us jihad. You said jihad is right in Afghanistan. Why are you saying jihad is wrong in Pakistan? We are following your fatwas. We are following what you trained us. The Pakistani ulemas have not been able to come up with an answer to this. And therefore, the TTP is gaining in strength because there is no counter to the argument that has been made. And then, so some group of ulemas said, only a state can declare jihad, individual cannot. So he says, fine, we've got now our government, we've got a parallel government, we've got 11 provinces, we are a government, we have a central shura, and we have ministries, we are a government. So we have declared jihad, so you tell us what is wrong. Right? So Kashmir, the threat will remain. Some frustrated Pakistan may try and push some people into Kashmir, but uh, the Indian army and the grid that it has, I think we are very secure. And I don't think there were millions of arms that came, which you mentioned, maybe a slip of the tongue, which you mentioned. Yes, there has been weaponry which has been coming from Pakistan itself. Now, the other question is that the US has left behind $7 billion worth of weapons and armaments in Afghanistan when they left. That has filtered down from the Taliban to the TTP. It has gone to the Balochistan, a very sophisticated weaponry. I don't think so yet anything has been found in Kashmir. But that is one uh, possibility or a threat that could happen. But I think the TTP is very well geared to fighting in Pakistan. The Taliban is more interested in Afghanistan itself. So that danger, I don't think so, is there at the moment. Sir, uh, my question is on Pakistani nuclear policy. So recently, Pakistan announced nuclear, nuclear policy, policy, sir. So they announced a, a full spectrum deterrence policy where they mentioned that they have from zero to 2750 kilometers. So 2750 is well explained by their missile range. But there's been a lot of controversy on what the zero means. So what do they mean? Do they mean ultra, uh, ultra low yield tactical nukes or what do they mean? That is my first question. And the second question to Dr. Devshay, sir. That is on uh, a, a book by Hassan Abbas on Return of Taliban. He mentions a curious incident where, say, where it says India attempted to uh, contact Anas Haqqani. So uh, Haqqani, as we know, have terror links. So my question is, are we seeing a policy shift from engaging with the moderates like Mullah Ghani Ab Ab Baradar to other factions as well? So these are my two questions. You see, on the nuclear thing, you will remember this famous uh, politician in Pakistan called Sheikh Rashid who talked about Pow Pow. Okay, bomb. So maybe they're talking about the tactical nuclear weapons, which they say they will uh, authorize even artillery strikes. You know, I don't know how they're going to do it, but that is possibly what they are talking about. That uh, zero, that you know, used battlefield uh, nukes, what they call them, tactical nuclear weapons. On the, uh, the second question was India attempted to contact Anas Haqqani. You know, it's very easy to say where, where is the proof for being? How do you establish it? And I think any country you know, will be in touch with everybody in the neighborhood. And I think the relationship that we have developed with the moderate Afghans across the Hindu Kush, with the Tajiks, the Hazaras, the Uzbeks, you know, that has always stood us in good stead. Not that we're not in touch with the Pashtuns. So it's been across the board. As far as, that's what I mentioned. India is very well regarded in Afghanistan across the board because we don't have any agenda. And why would we talk to Anas Akani for what? Sir, the moderates have been sidelined, so they are the ones calling the shots with Mullah Yaqub. As you but know. the Taliban themselves have asked you to come and take projects. So you don't need Anas Akhani. You, you know the Taliban central leadership are saying, come and complete your projects. We will send our military people to train. Uh, you know, whatever you want, we will provide security, open your diplomatic mission. So the hesitation is from India. Not so much that, you know, so we don't need to have uh, factional uh, people that who we have to be in touch with. But to be, if I may, you know, to answer your question, is there a policy shift in India? To my mind, there is. Because, you know, the days when we used to say that there's no difference between good Taliban and bad Taliban, we don't hear that talk anymore. So there clearly is a policy 
uh, shift, that you're prepared to engage with someone who is in power, and you're prepared to look the other way as far as the ideological orientation of that person in power is. Nobody quite understands what the Taliban in Afghanistan is going to evolve into. But as a pragmatic, tactical way of dealing with the situation, we are, we are, we are doing so. So I would say that there is a certain shift in uh, a position. But may I just you know, go back to the earlier question about uh, Kashmir and, you know, we all know what the ISI tried to do in, Pakistan, in Jammu and Kashmir from, the, from 1989 uh, onwards. But I think it's important we look at a broader context, that if there is instability in your neighborhood, you cannot insulate yourselves from it. So after the kind of situation which emerged in Afghanistan, after the Soviet invasion, given your relations with Pakistan, it was inevitable that there would be blowback in India. Because if you, if you put Kashmir aside for the moment, you look at instability in Myanmar and the consequences that has for India in the Northeast, especially in Manipur and in any other state. The fact is you are integrated with your neighborhood. There is no way you can graduate beyond it. You have to remain engaged. Uh, uh, you have to remain engaged with it. And certainly one way of remaining engaged with it is stop demonizing it. You know, you have to deal with it on its own terms and you have to avoid playing committed strokes. I'll uh, add 30 seconds to this. In his Kidwai statement of uh, zero kilometers, which was made in month of September, the one you are referring to, now he said uh, zero kilometers, it does imply something like what uh, Mr. Devasara said, um, non-strategic weapons or tactical nuclear weapons or something like that. It could also imply a something like an ADM, you know, what we call it an atomic demolition munitions, something like an atomic mine, you know, which is zero kilometers. When you are advancing, it will be zero kilometers. So, you know, if you try to derive out meanings out of what he's saying, and Kidwai has been in this game for last 40 years, and he is the authority, and he's speaking into a foreign audience, it mattered to us to study why does he say that we will fire from zero kilometers to 2,350 kilometers? He is conveying a message across to Colonel Ajay, you know, who spoke earlier, na? he's from the Armored Corps. There's a message being conveyed across to him. Okay. Anybody else? So, last question, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, my question is like related to all these questions. So, like, India has no first use nuclear policy, but Pakistan's policy is not so clear, right? And Pakistan is currently going through a crisis uh, with all TTP and economic crisis and well, as well. So in the future, there might be a spillover to India, right? So uh, in that context, what risk India could have with that their unstable nuclear policy and the arsenal with it? And China is... Ever What's the question? You like the new no, no first use policy or you don't like it? Like how would India handle such a situation when Pakistan's uh, leadership and army, they are out of hands and they could target the weapons to us. See, it's, I mean, one has to be realistic. And while there is instability in Pakistan and the situation is very bad, uh, but no one who makes a realistic assessment of Pakistan so far has said that in Pakistan you have the kind of situation like you have in Somalia, where the two wings of the army are fighting it out and there is civil war and there is a risk of the nuclear assets going into the hands of one party. You know, that kind of risk is not, uh, is not present. Uh, and I don't think we should exaggerate the internal crisis in Pakistan and imagine as if the worst case scenario is upon us and we have to take uh, measures uh, uh, in response. You know, this is what I mean when I say that uh, uh, let's not uh, uh, let's not go down the path of self-fulfilling prophecy. Don't imagine the worst and then act as if the worst is upon you. Uh, it's not a realistic situation that Pakistan's nuclear assets uh, are in the hands of uh, someone who who is outside all control. I'll just add to that. I don't think so. The nuclear, I agree with the Basra, but that is not the issue. You know turmoil in Pakistan, whether it's political or economic. I'm more concerned about the economic turmoil in Pakistan. 
I am especially concerned about the issue of water. You know, Pakistan, according to Pakistani think tanks, will probably become an absolute water scarce country in the next three to four years. Less than 500 cubic meters per capita per annum. Drought like conditions in parts of the country. So, in a situation like that, not that it will happen, hopefully it will not happen, but there is something that contingent planning that needs to be done, maybe in think tanks and uh, other institutions. If there is a movement of people from Sindh or from South Punjab, they won't cross the desert of Balochistan or going to Iran or to Afghanistan. The only country left is India. So I think we should have some contingency planning that in case the situation further deteriorates, and therefore it's very important for think tanks and for young people like you to be able to look at Pakistan internal developments and situation, especially the economy, especially issues of water and agriculture. How bad is it going to get and make a prediction for the next two or three years and what impact that will have on India? Agriculture, for example, Pakistan has the largest irrigation network in the world, yet today it is importing three million tons of wheat. Similarly, with other crops also. So, what impact does that have? You saw on television the riots from Atta and you know things like that. Maybe because the bad distribution on ships were not coming or whatever. The fact is, there was a food crisis. This does this deteriorate? So, all you young people who are here in the audience and working on research should be looking at these issues over the next short to medium term. What impact will that have on, potentially, on India that could have? Not the nuclear issue. I agree with Ambassador Akbar there. Thank you. So before I end here, um, there are young people on the stage also, sir. You said young people on the audience. You missed the young people. Uh, I'll end by one question myself, sir. To you, sir. What happens if, pa if Pakistan finally pushes the refugees, Afghan refugees back, which they are threatening to do so, sir? Uh, will it cause an actual conflagration between Pakistan and China, Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan? Because that's a threat which is they are now trying to say so. And uh, to you, Ambassador Raghavan, sir, my question relates to what is giving you hope between India and Pakistan? I mean, there is seemingly no hope of relationship, there is no ambassador, no, uh, uh, I mean, there's nothing, no people to people contact except the cricket team coming. There's nothing hai. So, where is, where are you seeing the hope, sir? So, on the uh, uh, issue of refugees, see, bulk of these refugees are Pashtuns. And if you talk to a Pashtun, whether it is that side of the Durand or on the Pakistani side, they say, ye hamara vatan hai. Hum apne vatan mein hai. Hum Afghani honge ya ye Pakistani hai, but ye hamara vatan hai. You're not doing us a favor by being in our lands of Amjad Durani. They consider the entire land up to Atak as Afghan homeland. So that is one issue. Second issue before Afghanistan, the discontent it is going to cause among the Pashtuns of Pakistan, the 31 million Pashtuns. If you're going to push out their brethren, same tribe, same uh, ethnicity, it's going to cause a lot of resentment within Pakistan too. And third, as I mentioned earlier, Afghanistan cannot handle this, this is a humanitarian crisis. According to World Food Program and other UN agencies, 90% of the people face a threat of starvation. Now, in this you put 1.7 million people more. See, can you imagine the humongous crisis which will happen? And finally, I don't think so. Pakistan has the administrative capability to push 1.7 million people out of their country. Where do they have transportation? Where are the camps? How are they going to feed these people and take them to the Durand, whether it is Chaman or whether it is Thorkam? How are they going to push them back? So there's a lot of issues, but I think it is a leverage with the Taliban, telling them that, look, if you don't cooperate with us on the subject of TTP, we will can do this. This is a threat they are holding out. Well, to be... You know, very brief. I think uh, uh, basically countries act according to their self-interest. And neither in Pakistan nor in India is there a significant body of opinion which believes that uh, a situation like you have between Europe, in Europe, between Russia and Ukraine is in our interest. So that's why I think things will never go down uh, will never get worse beyond a point, and there will always be efforts 
to try to stabilize the situation. It doesn't mean that India and Pakistan will have a perfect uh, uh, relationship, no. But you will constantly have attempts to stabilize because it is in your interest to uh, do so because you have too many other problems and you don't want to be going down the path of having major conflict with any of your neighbors. So that's what I feel quite confident about. With that, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for a very understanding audience. And I want to thank, please give a good hand for the esteemed panelists. And thank you very much. And thank you, sirs, for a great afternoon. And I'll say, peace is war. <laughs>